praise the Lord. We want to consider something very important from the Word of God. But before we look into it, can we just have a brief moment of prayer? Our Father, we thank you. We bless your name for this day in which you have made, a day that we should rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Lord, we pray even as we look at something important from your Word, we pray you will teach us your Word, you will enlighten us through your Word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. This day, we will be looking at the topic, the balance between faith and fear. The balance between faith and fear. Our text, we're taking from Mark. We have about uh, six places to read in our text. So in Mark chapter 11, let's begin with that. Mark chapter 11, the balance between faith and fear. Mark 11 in verse 22. It says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. That was what Jesus Christ was saying. Have faith in God. And then Jesus Christ, who was saying this, have faith in God, was the same person saying this in Matthew 10, verse 26 to 31. Let's read it. In Matthew 10, verse 26 to 31. It says, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and he that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the in the year that preach you upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him. But rather fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, that is talking about God. He said, do not fear those people who cannot, uh, who can only kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear him, that is God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a fatting, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. In verse 31, fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. You can see in this place that Jesus Christ. In, in the first place we read, Mark eleven twenty two, 22, he said, Have faith in God. And now he's saying, Fear God. That's to show that there's a balance. There's a balance between faith and fear. Because if we don't have this balance, the world will not be balanced. The world will be unstable. Let's look at Hebrews. Let's look at what the scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, I read from verse 28. Hebrews 12 in verse 28. Wherefore we receiving the kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And godly fear. And godly fear. So is there anything as godly fear? Does godly fear exist? Yes, it exists. You see, faith and fear uh, somewhat looks, uh, faith and fear somewhat looks alike. That is, they uh, look somewhat similar. It's just that faith is of the positive side while fear is of the negative. But you see, when one is uh, trusting in the Lord, when one depends totally on the Lord, it's of faith. And also one can fear God. One can tremble at His presence. That is, one keeps His commandment. One does what is right in His sight. You can see, one has faith in God and at the same time one fears God. And there is a balance between that faith and fear. That's what we're looking at. In Hebrews again, in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, I read from verse 31. Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 31. You see, we read in Hebrews 12 verse 28 uh, that let us have grace that we may serve God acceptably with reverence, that is with, with respect, with veneration, and what godly fear and godly fear and now let's look at hebrews 10 verse 31 it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living god it is a fearful thing yes why is it a fearful thing because we are serving the god we are serving god with what with reverence and godly fear 
So if we, uh, it is a fearful thing to fall into the into the hands of the living God. That is, we ensure we keep His commandment. We ensure that we do all what He said we should do, so that we will not fall into His hand because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. Then let's look at First Corinthians ten. In verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I read from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I read from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, sorry, verse 12. It says in verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh is standard take heed lest he fall. Let him that thinketh is standard take heed lest he fall. You see, this talks about is this balance between faith and fear. It talks about the gap. It talks about the gap between faith and fear. Just as Paul the Apostle told the Philippian brethren that they should let their moderation known before known unto all men, seeing that the Lord is at hand. This gap is being talked about here. Uh, this gap that is being talked about here is the separation between extreme faith that will make one to exaggerate or manipulate the promises of God, thus tempting God, an extreme fear that will make one to be manipulated or displaced physically, spiritually, mentally, psychologically, or otherwise. That was why Jesus Christ told um, Satan when he came to tempt, uh, he spoke the word of God against Satan when he came to tempt him, when he said that what you shall, if you can uh, fall down, he took him to a pinnacle of, her, of the temple and told him that if he shall cast, he, he should cast himself, that himself down. He quoted the promises of God and said, "The angels will will guide thee, and and they will not allow your feet to 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 slip." And you see, he quoted the promises of God, and Jesus Christ now quoted the promise. He, he quoted the promises of God against him and Jesus Christ redirected it and said that what thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy what thy God you can see he quoted it in a wrong way he quoted it in a wrong way and if one believes that he exaggerated the promise of God he exaggerated God's promise and if one believes that it will make one if one believes that that is an exaggerated faith and it will make one to what to stumble, it will make one to fall. If Jesus Christ could do that, if Jesus Christ could do that, how much more we, how much more we who are followers of Him? You see, if we tie to this message, if we tie to this message as the importance of fear, it will shift the perception of the listeners to negativity. Seeing the word of God kicked against that, and it will as well diminish the understanding of the listeners. In the preacher's perspective to think ponder and act outside the perimeter of positivity it will drive the focus of the listeners from the graciousness of the scriptures that makes them to have victory moreover it will render the message extreme and outrageous seeing it has lost its balance decency and moderation let all things be done decently and in order, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. It will have lost if we, if we uh, tie to this message as the importance of fear. It will render the message extreme and outrageous, seeing it has lost its balance, its decency, and moderation. Instead, let this title remain: the balance between faith and fear, and it will portray the true as well as real essence of faith. Project fear as a safety valve for intervening in the propensity for manifesting exaggerated faith, thus establishing the balance between faith and fear and making us to be on a safer side. We'll consider, uh, before we look at three points, let's look at Ecclesiastes. To back up what we just said, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 from verse 15 to 18 ecclesiastes the balance solomon the preacher talked about this balance in ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 15 to 18 all 
things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. In verse 16, be not righteous over much. You can see that it was saying, you know, the, the Bible said, uh, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Yes, the just is also the righteous. The just shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And so, if you are if you are over much righteous, it means you are over much faithful. It means you have over faith. It means your faith has been exaggerated. Your faith has been uh, uh, it has been so uh, 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 tuned to the figure of speech which I call hyperbole. And then you begin to act on the promises. You begin to make the uh, uh, you, you begin to overrate it. You begin to make it so protracted and the promises of God so protracted that and you have that kind of faith, so that kind of broad faith that is even beyond the what is supposed to be what the scripture what the scripture penned down for us and that kind of faith what will happen what will happen solomon the preacher having lived you know he was the wisest king ever he was the wisest king ever before any king came after and after the kings before and after he has been the wisest and so you see he said this he said this as a result of the experience the life he had lived on earth and the experience he had garnered in his life and his living. Look at what he said in verse 16. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? He was talking about the balance here. The balance has to be struck. The balance has to be struck. Let Paul the Apostle even said to even uh, to even back up, to even back up what Solomon the preacher said, Paul the Apostle said, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. He said, Let all things be done decently and in order. All things should be done decently and in order. Even though you are righteous, even though you are faithful, even though you are prayerful and what have you, he said, Let all things be done decently. There should be principles backing everything up. There should be the basis of our faith, the basis for our faith, which is the word of God, we should act on that word. We should not exaggerate the promises of God like Satan did. He said that what he was quoting the word of God that he should that Jesus Christ should jump down, seeing that the Lord has promised that the angels will protect him. You see, Jesus Christ also quoted the word of God against him. He said that what thou shalt not tell the Lord thy God. So if one is um, um, exaggerating faith, it means one is tempting the Lord. So that is why Solomon the preacher here was striking a balance between faith and fear. He said, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? In verse 17, Be not over much wicked. Yes, that's the, the negative side now. He has talked about the positive side, doing it over much. And now he's talking about the negative side now over much also. Both are what? Both are extreme and they are not good. They are not good. So there need to be a balance. He said, be not uh, over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? In verse 18 now, it is good that thou shouldest stay cold of this. Solomon the preacher is instructing, is admonishing, is, is, is giving a counsel. He said, it is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thy hand. Don't despise this. Don't despise this message. I'm passing a message across. I'm passing a message across. I need to take heed to that message. The balance between faith and fear. He said that what? He said, take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thy hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. He that feareth God. It is only those who have the godly fear, those who fear God, those who fear God, those whose natural fear tilts to the positive side, tilts to the positive angle, that is the godly fear, those are the people that will be able to come forth of them all. That will 
that will take us, that will lead us to the three points we'll be looking at. We'll be considering three points as we look at this message. The first point is the godly fear that authenticates our entrance into heaven. The godly fear that authenticates our entrance into heaven. In the book of Psalm chapter 9, Psalm chapter 9, uh, 19, in verse 9, Psalm chapter 19, Psalm chapter 19, I read from verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous all together. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's clean. The fear of the Lord is not dirty. The fear of the Lord does not have torment. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is clean. It does not have torture. It does not have torment. It does not cripple. It does not uh, electrocute. No. It does not uh, lead one to the negative angle. No. The fear of the Lord is clean. It even draws one closer to God as well as seals one's soul for eternal peace, eternal joy, eternal merriment, everlasting fellowship with him forever in heaven. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, enduring forever. You can see that enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous all together. I pray that will be our own Lord. In Psalm 111, Psalm 111 in verse 10, Psalm 111 in verse 10. Look at what the scripture says there. In Psalm 111 in verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all they that do his commandments, his praise endured forever. His praise. He has made us already to be his praise, to be in, in, in his, his name, to be his, 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 to be for him a name, to be for him a praise, a glory, and a people. So he has made us unto himself already. And if we do that, if we have that godly fear towards him, if we have him as our fear, he said, let the Lord God be your fear. He said, if we have him as our fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That is when we begin to see the way. That is when we begin to see clearly. That is when our eyes will be open to know him more, to know him more. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all day that do his commandment. When we do his commandment, when we keep his commandment, we will have understanding of him. We have understanding of his of his of his sovereignty, of his uh, of his uh, vastness. We have understanding of that. In Second Corinthians chapter seven, in verse eight to eleven. Second Corinthians chapter seven. Let's look at what the scripture tells us in Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians chapter seven. I read from verse eight to eleven. It says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. This is Paul the Apostle talking to the Corinthians. He said, Though I did repent, for I perceived that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. In verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance. For godly sorrow, godly sorrow, godly sorrow, godly fear. For godly sorrow, for godly fear, worketh repentance to salvation, not to be retent, repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Have, is there any word, is there any uh, phrase such as godly sorrow, godly sorrow? Some people may begin to wonder or imagine, is sorrow not negative? Is there anything like godly sorrow? Yes, there is. It said for godly sorrow, also talking about godly fear, if you look at it in another perspective, it's also talking about godly fear, that is what makes People to tremble at God's presence, to surrender totally unto Him through His Son Jesus Christ, and to and to keep His commandment, to keep His commandment. That's the godly sorrow there. That's the godly fear there. He said, "But the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of this world is it will bring death. That will not give you life." He said, "For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord." And it is that fear, that godly fear, that will make you to tremble, having received the gift of God that brings salvation. In verse 11, for behold, this self-same thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sought, 
what carelessness is wrapped in you? Yea, what clearing of yourselves? Yea, what indignation? Yea, what fear? Yea, what vehement desire? Yea, what zeal? Yea, what revenge? In all things ye have approved of yourself to be clear in this matter. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 32. Let's look at Jeremiah 32. I read from verse 40. Jeremiah 32 in verse 40. It says, And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their heart that they will not depart from me. I will put my fear. What a joyful thing for, for us, for every one of us, that the Lord put his fear in our heart that will make us to walk in his ways, that will make us to walk uprightly. In Jude verse 23, let's look at what the scripture says in Jude verse 23. In Jude verse 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Yes, it is this that makes them others save with fear, putting, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Let's read on. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. You can say it's the Lord who does this. He does not want anyone to perish. He does not want anyone to fall into eternal perdition. So that is why are he hating the garment spotted by the flesh, spotted by the world, is calling everyone to repentance, calling everyone to turn away so that they can be washed from their sins. In Psalm 118, in verse 6. Psalm 118, in verse 6. Psalmist knew about this fear. He knew that this fear is godly. There exists, there, there exists something like as godly fear. There exists something as godly fear, which was why he said this in Psalm 1 verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do unto me. I pray that will also be our testimony. Hebrews chapter 13 in verse 6. Talking about the same thing. Talking about the same thing. It was repeated in Hebrews chapter 13. I read from verse 6, the Lord, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. If you know that the Lord is my helper, the psalmist said that I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord. So he knew God as his helper, and so if you know God as your helper, you will not fear what man shall do unto you. In Isaiah chapter 8, I read from verse 13, Isaiah chapter 8, from verse, I read, in Isaiah chapter 8, from verse 13, it says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Let him be your dread. Walk in dread. Walk in fear before him. Let him be your fear. Let him be your, your dread. In, Psalm, in Isaiah 41, in verse 10, Isaiah 41, in verse 10, it says, in Isaiah 41, in verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea. I will help thee, yea. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God has assured you already that I will strengthen you. It will uphold you. It will, it will uphold you with the right hand of his righteousness. This is the fear of God. This fear, the godly fear that authenticates our entrance into heaven. It is the fear of God. It is making God our fear and not man. It is making God our fear and not princes. It is making God our fear and not the devil. You see, there are three types of fear. There are three types of fear. This is one of them. It authenticates our entrance into heaven because it makes us to live holily, righteously, and in a way well pleasing unto God, having kept all his commandments. Therefore, God endorses this type of fear. God endorses it. God approves of it because it makes us to submit unto him, be drawn unto him, and take heed unto the admonition as well as injunction given by him. We'll be looking at three things under this point. The first thing we'll be looking at is fear that satisfies our whole duty. Fear that satisfies our whole duty. Solomon, the wise preacher, Solomon, the, the great preacher, look at what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, the conclusion, the finality, the inference of the whole matter. He said, 
fear God and keep his commandment for this is the whole duty of man you do not have any other duty other than to fear God and to keep his commandment in verse 14 why should we fear God why should we keep his commandment for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil so we know already that God will bring every work into judgment whether it is good or bad he will bring it into judgment that is why we must fear him we must fear him we must fear him and we must keep his commandment. Let's look at Proverbs. Proverbs. We have seen already before that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is what enlightens us, is what opens our eyes to the wisdom of God, to the to the power of God that is able to save and to transform and to regenerate. In Proverbs chapter 4, in Proverbs chapter 4, I read from verse 4 to 7. Proverbs 4. I read from verse 4 to 7. He says, He he taught me also and said unto me, Let thy heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Yes, for you to live, you have to keep the commandment of, of the Lord. In verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. With all thy getting, get understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Get wisdom with all that getting, get understanding. In Psalm 112, I read from verse, from Psalm 112, I read from verse 1. Psalm 112, Psalm 112, I read from verse 1. Praise you the Lord, blessed is the man that feared the Lord, that delighted greatly in his commandments. Psalm 128, verse 1 and 2. Let's look at what the scripture says in Psalm 128. In verse 1 and 2, it says, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. In verse 2, For thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands, happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. This is the fear that is godly. This fear is godly. It satisfies, it satisfies our whole duty unto God, which is fearing him and keeping his commandment. It was talked about by Solomon the preacher as a result of the wisdom of God upon him. He then said that wisdom is the principal thing that in all one's getting, once you get understanding, sin it is profitable to direct. Yes, wisdom is profitable to direct according to Ecclesiastes verse, uh, chapter 10 verse 10b. He then said that one should get wisdom and understanding without forsaking, forgetting, or declining from it, seeing it will keep as well as preserve one unto the heavenly kingdom, having delivered or granted one deliverance from every evil work, according to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. The second thing we'll be looking at here is fear that serves our wholesome devotion. Fear that serves our wholesome devotion. When you surrender unto the Lord, when you surrender unto the Lord, we have read already in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8 to 11, talking about the godly uh, sorrow, talking about the godly sorrow, the godly fear, that's what makes one to surrender unto the Lord, to submit unto the Lord, to uh, to submit, that's talking about submission, to devote one's life to the service of the Lord. You know Solomon said, remember not thy creator in the days of thy youth. So, it will make us to devote, we are safe to serve. When one surrenders unto the Lord, when one yields one's life unto the Lord in, to receive his salvation, then one is now uh, saved to serve, to serve him. One is now uh, employed. One is employed immediately to his service, to be in his service. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 3. I read from verse 11. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 3. I read from verse 11. Jeremiah 3 from verse 11. And the Lord said unto me, the backsliding in, in Jeremiah chapter 3, in verse 11, he said that the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 43, I, from verse 5 and, and 7. Isaiah chapter 43, from verse 5 and 7. Isaiah 43, from verse 5 and 7. Let's look at what that place tells us. It says, Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. In verse 7, every, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. In Exodus 23, verse 22 to 27, 
Exodus 23, from verse 22 to 27. Let's look at what he tells us. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, yes, there's a con condition here. There's a precondition for you to receive, for you to receive that uh, grace, that grace to, to do even what other people cannot do. That was the grace Moses received. That was the grace Joshua received. That was the grace Solomon received. It says, But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy enemies. Amen. And an adversary unto my adversaries. In verse 23, For my angels shall go before thee, and bring thee in, in unto the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Canaanite, and the Hevite, and the Jebusite, and I will cut them off. In verse 24, Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them, and quite break down their images. In verse 25, And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. He will only take away sickness if you can obey his voice. In verse 26, There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. In verse 27, I will send my fear before thee. Talking about the fear that, that serves our wholesome devotion. I will send my fear before thee and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come and I will make all thy enemies turn their backs unto thee yes when we serve the Lord when that when we have that fear that serves our wholesome devotion you see God will always fight for us and the enemies will not be able to prevail against us that was what as the Lord was commissioning Jeremiah to do his will they said that what they shall fight against thee but they shall not prevail against thee that is the fear that serves our wholesome devotion this is the fear that God uh, this is the fear of God that triggers us to submit ourselves to his salvation and unto his service yes this fear triggers us to submit ourselves unto his salvation and unto his service. Even Apostle James said, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he said, God resisted the proud, but giveth more grace unto the humble. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift, uh, and he shall lift you up lift us up. You see that as taken in James chapter 4 verse 6 to 8 and 10. As we humble ourselves to receive the salvation of the Lord and to be used of him in the service, he will surely grant us his salvation as well as lift us up. The fear that serves our wholesome devotion can also, we can also see that the picture is also found in Hebrews chapter 12 in verse 28 and 29. Hebrews 12 verse 28 and 29. Wherefore we receive in the kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why should we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear? Remember, we do that as a result, as a result of the fear of God in our heart, in our lives. Why should we do that? For our God, in verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. The third thing we'll be looking at here is fear that shows our wonderful dominion. Fear that shows our wonderful dominion. The Lord has made us already fearfully and wonderfully. So, I haven't known that, I haven't known that. So, we do not need to fear any other person. God has made us already. He, he has made, he, he said that we should, he should be our own fear. He should be our own fear. So, if at all we want to fear anything, let him be our own fear. So, we do not need to fear anything in this world. No, neither Satan, nor, 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 nor princes, nor man. We do not need to fear any other thing. In 2 Timothy, that was what Paul the Apostle was admonishing Timothy, a son in the faith. He said, don't be afraid of them. Do the work of God. Do the will of God. For he will raise you up. He will lift you up. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, in Psalm 139, verse 14, telling us that he has made us fearfully. He has made us wonderfully. Psalm 139, I read from verse 14. It says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that, that my soul knoweth right well. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. In Deuteronomy 28, in verse 9 and 10. Deuteronomy chapter 28, I read from verse 9 
Deuteronomy 28, I read from verse 9 and 10. It says, The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandment of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. What will happen to you? In verse 10, And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. When they see that you are walking in his ways, they will they when when you walk in his ways, the, the, the people will see that you are called by the name of the Lord as a result of the exhortation the God is going to run in your life. He said the Lord will establish your holy people. He said the Lord will what will make all people of the earth to see that you are called by his name. This is the godly fear in us that shows us the dominion, might, and power of God. And this fear of God in us exposes us to his magnificent glory and splendor. Thus, we have been enlightened on the ironclad fact that we who are made in his image and after his likeness are also given by God the dominion over all the things that he has created, hence making us to be unique to do his will, having been made fearfully and wonderfully. We'll be looking at the second point now. The second point, the godless fear that abrogates our entrance into heaven. The godless fear that abrogates, that stops, that destroys our entrance into heaven. What is this? Let's look at 1 John chapter 4 in verse 18. 1 John, the godless fear. This is a fear unnecessarily, unnecessary fear. Unnecessary fear, it is the godless fear in 1 John chapter 4 verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You can see, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. You see, God said, fear me, let me be your fear. He's not saying you should fear man. He's not saying you should fear Satan. He's not saying you should fear kings or princes. He said, let me be your fear. And so, any fear that comes outside God, outside the, the one that God has prescribed, or the one that God has uh, drawn for us, it is outside the perimeter. It is godless, godless fear that abrogates, and that fear will abrogate to stop our entrance into heaven. We need to get rid of that. We need to get rid of that fear. Let's look at Jude chapter uh, Jude verse ten to thirteen. Jude in verse ten to thirteen. Let's look at what that place tells us in Jude verse ten. Jude verse ten to thirteen. But this speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain saying of call. These are this these are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. You can see these people are godless. They are godless. They are without fear. They do not have the fear of God before them. They are godless. They are godless. He said, these are, uh, they are feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees, whose fruit withered without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by roots. What are they in that investigation? Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved. What is reserved for them? The blackness of darkness forever. That is the lake of fire. Hell, I pray that will not be our portion. Then, for that not to be our portion, we need to desist from this unnecessary godless fear. Fear that is outside the perimeter of godly fear. This is the fear of Satan, princes of man. This is the second type of fear, and it abrogates our entrance into heaven. This type of fear is destructive because it has torment. It abolishes our involvement in the things of God and it draws us far away from God. Apostle James knew this, which was why he said, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. In that fear right, is not made perfect in love. You see, this fear is of the devil, seeing it has torment and it cripples as well as electrocutes. That was what uh, uh, electrocuted uh, the herald and restrains one from talking. And from taking the urgent step that will make one to come boldly, that is with faith unto the throne of grace, to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The psalmist knew that this fear was not of God, which was why he said, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. In Psalm 118, verse 8 and 9, trust. Trust in man, princes, or devils is not of God, because even God is totally against it. It is abominable in his sight, which was why he said to Jeremiah the prophet, Cursed be the man that trusted in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the, from the Lord. 
that according to Jeremiah 17 verse 5, any fear that moves us away from God is godless. And any fear that makes our heart to depart from God uh, is godless. You see, any fear that makes all our heart to depart from God, neither to neither serve nor trust in Him for victory and triumph is godless. And God is greatly averse to that. But those who are submissive unto Him and trust in Him have a godly fear. That was why Prophet Jeremiah went on to say, Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. I pray the Lord will help us to fear Him only. In Jesus' name. We'll be looking at three things here. The first thing is fear. That, uh, we'll be looking at four things, rather. Four things. The first thing is fear that inhabits the impenitent. Fear that inhabits the impenitent. The hard-hearted. The hard-hearted. Those who don't want to repent. Those who don't want to repent. In the book of Isaiah chapter 1, the Lord gave a, a proposition to them, to the children of Israel. He said, if you... Uh, are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the lamb. But you see, some people will still refuse. Some people will still rebel. That was why the Lord said in Isaiah, let's read it in Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 18 to 20. We'll be reading verse 20. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken in those who are the people who are impenitent. In Jeremiah chapter 44, in Jeremiah 44, I read from verse 4 to 6. Jeremiah 44, in verse 4 to 6. I'll be it. I sent unto you all my servant, the prophet, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. In verse 5. But they hacking not, nor inclined their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn no incense unto other gods. In verse 6. Wherefore my fury and my anger was poured forth, and was kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as at this day. You see that there? And let's look at uh, let's look at Exodus chapter thirteen. Exodus chapter thirteen. I read from verse uh, Exodus chapter thirteen from verse seventeen and eighteen. Exodus chapter thirteen in verse seventeen and eighteen. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, "Let's peradventure the people." Repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God fed, let, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up and nest out of the land of Egypt. You can see God prevented them from, as a result of the hardness of their heart, God prevented them from uh, passing through the to the through the closed way. And despite that, they still hardened their heart against the Lord. That's the fear that inhabits the penitent. The fear that inhabits the penitent. In Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter three, Ezekiel chapter three, Ezekiel chapter three, verse four to twelve, we will we'll be reading uh, uh, selected verses there. Ezekiel chapter three, Ezekiel chapter three, in verse four, and he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee in unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. In verse in verse six, not to many people of a strange. Uh, verse, let's read verse, verse 5. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of an hard language, but to the house of Israel. In verse 6, not to many people of a strange speech and of an hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely, if I send thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. You can see that. God is saying, if I have sent you to people, a stranger, they would have hearkened unto thee. But I'm sending you unto Israel, the house of Israel. Those people are hardened. They are impenitent. They do not want to turn away. They are, they are not repentant. They are not repentant. In verse 7, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. I pray that will not be our portion. That is the fear that inhabit the impenitent. They are godless. They are godless. And they don't want to listen to what will make them to turn away from what will save them. In Psalm 95, Psalm 95 in verse 18. Psalm 95, I read from verse 18. Let's look at what the scripture tells us. In Psalm 95, in verse, in verse 18, Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 95, in verse, okay, let's read Proverbs 29, Proverbs 29, I read from verse 1, Proverbs 29, Proverbs 29, I read from verse, from verse 1. Proverbs 29, in verse 1, He that being often reproved, 
Hardiness is next, shall suddenly be destroyed and die without remedy. You see, hardness of heart there again. This is the type of fear that pervades the heart and mind of the sinners. It is a godless fear. It is a fear that makes them to continue in their sins instead of repent from them. And it's a fear that makes them engage more and more in iniquity instead of receiving Jesus Christ into their lives to become their Lord and Savior. The second thing we'll be looking at here is fear that encircles the inordinate. Fear that encircles the inordinate. In Luke chapter 15, from verse 11 to 32, talking about the prodigal son, we'll not be able to read that, talking about the prodigal son, this was the fear that made the younger son to stray far away from home and to spend his substance with righteous living. That kind of fear that will not make one to be prudent, but live inordinately as well as excessively, wasting and not conserving is not of God. Even Jesus Christ exemplified prudence by commanding that the 12 baskets remaining should be kept and not wasted. You see, even Proverbs 27, 12 tells us the prudent man foresee the evil and hide it himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. That was the case of the prodigal son, but thank God he retraced his steps by realizing his sin, by realizing his errors, and returning back to his father. His father, having seen the sincerity of his heart, forgave as well as welcomed him back. The third type of fear, Godless fear, we'll be looking at here is fear that inhibits the increase. Fear that inhibits the increase. In Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30, Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30, we will not be able to read that. Talking about the uh, the uh, the, ma the servant whom the master gave him one talent. He went and hid his talent in the earth. What happened to him? What happened to him? What happened to him? Let's look at it. In Matthew 25, in verse 20, let's read from verse 20, 20, 25, from 25 to 30 now. And I was afraid, and went and hid my talent, and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not struck. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. In verse 28, Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which had ten talents. In verse 29, For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. In verse 30, And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can see that he, he underestimated the he underestimated the meridian gift, and what happened to him? He lost it. He lost it, the gift, and he lost his life as a result of not uh, not being uh, bold to use what God has given unto him. He was thoughtless, and then he eventually lost that. In Matthew chapter 6, let's look at Matthew 6, in verse 25 to 33. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? You see, Jesus Christ was telling us to not think, to not worry, to not be anxious. In verse 33 now, he said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto you. And all these things shall be added unto you. This type of fear is not of God. Seeing it does hinder blessing. This type of fear hinders blessing. Worrying unnecessarily. Worrying and anxiety. It, say it hinders blessing. It makes one to be given to unnecessary worry and anxiety. Thus making one to lose great blessings. If one had cast all one's cares upon Jesus Christ, according to 1 Peter 5, in verse 7, he would have cared for one, but now one assumes the role of a body, uh, one assumes the role of body bearing in terms of worry, anxiety, fear, all inhibiting the increase that one ought to have had had one dropped all those uh, unnecessary worry, anxiety, and fear down. Also, the type of fear that comes as a result of underestimating meridian gift. The servant who was given talent, he was given talent, the one talent, instead of him to use, put it to good use, he underestimated it as a result of maybe envy, pride, and what have you. He saw others, others were given five, others were given two, and then he only was the one giving one. He underestimated it, he underrated it, he undervalued it, and what happened? He lost it, and he lost his life eventually. You see, he underestimated meridian gift given by God. You see, it, uh, it, and when he did that, it, it brought him to 
loss, he brought it to great loss. That was what happened to the servant who failed to use the one talent that was given unto him. He eventually lost it and he was eventually lost. The fourth fear we'll be looking at is fear that initiates the indignation. Fear that initiates the indignation. Fear that initiates the indignation. In Revelation 21, in Revelation 21, in verse 8 and 27, he said, But the fearful are not believing and they are abominable. This is the godless fear. The fearful, God, the fearful, the fearful, the fearful, and what the unbelieving. And they are abominable and murderers and warmongers and sorcerers and idolaters and not liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In verse 27, and they shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. In Psalm 9, verse 17, Psalm 9, verse 17, let's look at what that place tells us. It says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. What will happen to those who do iniquity? What will happen to them in Proverbs chapter 11 in verse 21? Proverbs 11 in verse 21. It says, Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. In Romans chapter 1 in verse 18, let's look at what that tells us in Romans chapter 1 in verse 18. Romans chapter 1 in verse 18. It says, but for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Those people are fearful. They are fearful and as a result of their fear, they are, they are unrighteous. They are wicked. That is a godless fear. It will eventually end them in perdition. Let's look at uh, Colossians chapter 3 in verse 5 and 6. Colossians chapter 3 in verse 5 and 6. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, inordinate affection, that was what uh, the prodigal son had, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, verse 6, for which things sake the wrath of God covered on the children of disobedience, you see that, the wrath of God, the indignation of the Lord, the judgment of God, come upon the children of disobedience, those who disobey his commandment, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 8, let's look at what the scripture tells us. First Thessalonians chapter 4 in verse 8. For uh, he said, He therefore that despised, despised not man, but God, who had also given us his Holy Spirit. And what will happen to those who despise? What will happen to them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in verse 8 to 12? And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. You see that? Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and uh, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. In verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, in verse 10, and with all deceivable, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, loading, loading, loading. God's wrath, indignation, and judgment are all loading to be unloaded upon the wicked. They are all loading to be unloaded upon the wicked in wickedness and the unrighteous in unrighteousness. That was why Isaiah the prophet said, according to God's word, there is no peace to the wicked. According to Isaiah 57 verse 21, you see, which means that the evil doers as well as workers of iniquity should prepare for the retribution of their vile affections and evil lifestyle. As long as they neglect the message of salvation and refuse to repent, they should better prepare for damnation. God's judgment will not elude them. No matter how they try to parry, they cannot for God's judgment because God's final verdict is that they are inexcusable. According to Romans chapter 2 verse 1 to 6. The third point we'll be looking at, the third point is the goodly fear, the good fear that ameliorates our existence before heaven. The goodly fear. The goodly fear. This is a fear that is neither godly nor godless. You see, but necessary to make our lives, our existence on earth as believers better, comfortable and convenient before we get to heaven. I pray that the Lord will help us to understand this in Jesus' name. We'll be looking at three things here. The first thing we'll be looking at is the fear. Fear that arises due to the oppression of the adrenaline hormone. Fear that arises due to oppression of the adrenaline hormone. In Acts chapter 16, 
in verse 25 to 14. Acts chapter 16, from verse 25. Acts chapter 16, from verse 25 to 14. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. In verse 27, And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Verse 28, But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Verse 29, Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. In verse 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You can see that that is as a result of the oppression of the adrenaline hormone. It is natural, that is a natural fear in everyone. They saw, they thought the prisoners had escaped and so they came. When they saw them, they trembled. They said, what must I do to inherit? What must I do to, what must, you see, he said, what, says, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. You can see that was a medium, a medium for them to be launched into the godly fear. If they had undo that negatively, if they had uh, uh, perceived that negatively and tilted, and it would have tilted them to the negative angle. But you see, they handled it positively. And they treated them to the positive angle that is to the godly fear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house, you see, that was now leading them to the godly fear. What happened after? And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in, in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. You can see that, and the rest of the story goes on. You see, that is the fear that arises due to the oppression of the adrenaline hormone. If this kind of fear is not there, then the world will be greatly unstable. The world will be greatly unbalanced and destabilized. This type of fear bridges the gap between the godly and godless fear. It acts somewhere in the middle, and if managed, tilt one to the positive angle. But if not, if mismanaged, what will happen? It will tilt one to the negative angle. The second thing we'll be looking at is fear that affords the opportunity to avoid humor. Fear that affords the opportunity to avoid humor. You see, in the time of Pharaoh, we'll be reading Exodus. We'll not be able to read that. I'll just mention it. Exodus chapter 7, chapter chapter 7, 8 or 2 to 15. Exodus 7, 8 or 2 to 15. You see, in the time of um, Pharaoh, and, and, and Moses, when Moses came and began to rock signs and wonders, you see the Egyptians also they were doing it, they were doing it. But it came to a time where the Egyptians were not able to do that anymore. And what happened, that was to show that God was more, God was magnificent. A fear that afforded the opportunity to avoid humor. You see, Pharaoh would have feared, Pharaoh would have uh, stopped all that and allowed the people to go, but he, he did not do that, he did not handle that, uh, he did not handle that uh, in a positive way. What, what then happened, it tilted him to the negative angle. He and all other Egyptians that were, were with him, that, that, were, that also joined him to do the evil, what happened to them? They all drowned in the Red Sea. Let's look at Judges chapter 16 from verse 6 to 31. Judges chapter 16 from verse 6. Judges chapter 16 from verse 6 to 31. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. In verse 7, And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green wheat that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Is to all true to that one. We'll not be able to read all that. But let me just tell you. You see, Samson was telling lies. He was telling lies. He is supposed to have feared. He saw that the woman was trying it on him. He's supposed to have had that natural fear and said, "What if? What if she is neither godly nor godless?" He's supposed to have had that natural fear. And what? And he's supposed not to have revealed the secret of his life. But you see, it was. Even despite the fact that he knew, he was conscious of the fact that the woman was trying it on him, he still what? He still left himself in her hand. That is the fear that afforded the opportunity to avoid humor. You see, they eventually plucked his eyes, they laughed at him, they, they mocked him, and but what happened? 
as the mercy of the Lord came to him at the final stage, the mercy of the Lord came to him, and the number he killed at his death, the number of the Philistines he killed at his death, were more than those he had killed in his lifetime. You see, if not, for, if not the mercy of God, he would have just been destroyed like that in the hand of the Philistines. Daniel, Daniel chapter 3 also. Daniel chapter 3 from verse 20 to 30. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3 from verse 20 to 30. This is the story of the uh, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sh the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The fear that for the opportunity to avoid more. This these people, uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar commanded that uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego should be thrown into the into the furnace, into the fiery furnace. But you see, they were not burnt. Those people who threw them were the ones who were born. You see, that's the fear that affords the opportunity to avoid humor. The, you, you see, it's, it's, something that, it's something that incites uh, laughter. It's something that incites humor. Somebody that was thrown in the fire was not born, but the person who threw him into the fire was born. That's, that's something that what evokes humor. That evokes humor. The fear, that fear would have made him to what? To, to avoid that, to avoid that, but you see, he handled it negatively, and the result of that was was uh, destruction, destruction of the people who threw them. In Second Chronicles chapter twenty, Second Chronicles chapter twenty, let's look at somebody who now handled the fear positively, the person, somebody who handled the fear positively, and he eventually brought him to safety. In Second Chronicles chapter twenty, from verse one to twenty nine, story of Jehoshaphat. You can read it in. You can read it later. We will not be able to read all that. Second Chronicles chapter twenty, from verse one to twenty nine. Second Chronicles twenty, from verse one to to twenty nine. We will read verse twenty. We will read verse twenty. Second Chronicles twenty twenty. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Joseph stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. What happened? Why was he saying all that? He had a news. He had a news. Let's look at the news in chapter 20, verse 1. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them mother beside the Ammonite, came against Joshua to battle. They came against him to battle in verse 2. Then there came some that told Joshua, saying, There come a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side, Syria. And behold, they be in Azazon Tema, which is Engedi in verse 3. And Joshua feared and set himself to seek the Lord. You can see this is a goodly fear. Why? Because it made him, it made him to what? To seek the Lord, to seek the Lord, so as to be safe, so as to be safe. He said, the name of the Lord is a strong toward the righteous runneth into it, and is safe, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. That resulted into what the Lord assured them in verse 17. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem, not be dismayed. Tomorrow, fear not, not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Then let's look at verse uh, 24. In verse 24, And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies falling to the earth, and none escaped. You can see that the angel of the Lord fought for them, fought their battle for them, and none of those enemies escaped. You see, in Psalm 70, in verse 4, Psalm 70, in verse 4, the Lord also tells us something there. Psalm 70 in verse 4. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee, and let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. Joseph had sought the Lord, and he will rejoice, and be, he was glad at the end of his seeking the Lord. In Psalm 35, in Psalm 35, verse 9 and 10. Let's look at what the scripture says. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee? We deliverance the poor from him that is too strong for him. Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. You see, this type of fear presents the opportunity for one to escape being laughed at. Yes, it, pre it presents the opportunity for, for one to escape being laughed at. But it seemed as though neither Pharaoh nor the enemies of the prophet and children of God, we are discerning enough to use this as a privilege to escape swift as well as certain destruction that will make them to be laughed at. You can see, 
that will make them to be laughed at. Sometimes when we are reading um, the story of Pharaoh, we, be, we begin to laugh. Sometimes when we are reading the book of Daniel, as when the, the people were thrown into into uh, the fiery furnace, when Shadrach, Meshach, those people who threw them were burnt. Those people who were thrown were not burnt. Sometimes we, that evokes laughter in us. That evokes humor, and we begin to laugh. Even the people who, uh, Daniel who was put in the lion's den, the lion did not eat him. The lion did not do anything to him. The lion did not hurt nor harm him. And then those people who accused him were thrown, and the lion had the mastery of them. That evokes humor, evokes laughter, and then this fear, goodly fear, is to what to make them to, it affects them, the opportunity to avoid humor, but these people handle it negatively, and it, as they handle it negatively and mismanage it, it eventually leads them to destruction, that I pray that will not be our portion, we will handle it positively. The goodly fear, the natural fear, we will handle it positively, and it will teach us to to, to the godly fear that will eventually make us to be, to be preserved in Jesus' name. You see, that instead they had in their heart the more against against the people of God and immediately and the immediate aftermath the immediate aftermath of their hardness of heart against God's people was destruction. I pray that the Lord will give us the discerning spirit to know when destruction is at the corner and escape immediately in Jesus' name. The third point under the, the third part in this point we'll be looking at is fear that acclimatizes with the odds of an adaptable habitation. Fear that acclimatizes with the odds of an adaptable habitation. In Jonah chapter 1, Jonah chapter 1, from verse 15 and, uh, and 16, Jonah chapter 1, from verse 5 to 16, Jonah chapter 1, from verse uh, 5 to 16. We'll not be able to read all that. We'll, we'll just... Uh, Jonah chapter 1 from verse 5 to 16. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and they, he lay and was fast asleep. You can see that these people feared. They feared. And when Jonah exposed himself, he said, I'm the one. Throw me inside. Because if you don't throw me inside, you'll begin to you'll continue to suffer. And then he threw him inside the waters. They threw him inside the waters and what happened? The fish uh, swallowed him. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, we see Jonah's prayer. We see Jonah's prayer and his deliverance. His deliverance in that. Uh, you see, he acclimatized and then we see his preaching. He went also to preach. He went to preach in the place that God told him to preach. He acclim his, the fear that was in him acclimatized with the odds of an adaptable habitation that is he went to a strange land to preach and god knew delivered him even in all he handled that fear uh positively he handled it positively let's look at daniel chapter uh in daniel now let's look at daniel chapter one the story of daniel that Daniel 1 verse 1 to 8. In the third day of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came, Josh, came the Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of, the, of God, which he carried into the land of China, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels on into the treasure house of his God. And the king spoke unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning knowledge and understanding science, so, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. In verse 5, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. In verse 6, now among these were of the were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Ananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and, and to Ananiah of Shadrach, and to, and to Michelle of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. In verse 8, But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested that the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself you can see that purpose there that purpose there he proposed in his heart let's let's look at from verse 17 to 21 
As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuch, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. In verse 20, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. In verse 21, in verse 21, and Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. You see there that Daniel was brought out, he was marked out for for success as a result of his his uh, his, his management. Of that fear, the fear that acclimatizing with the odds of an adaptable habitation. You see, he was in a strange land, and despite the fact that he was in a strange land, he was still purposeful, he still determined, he knew where God was taking him to. In, in Daniel in chapter 5, in verse 12, you see, Daniel was recommended here, he was recommended here to interpret the dream of, uh, to interpret the handwriting. That wrote against the wall of the place that stone during the time of Belshazzar, that is Nebuchadnezzar's son. In Daniel 5, verse 12, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the in this in the same Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. You see that in Daniel chapter 6, verse 25 to 28, also talks about uh, how that King Darius. Who, who was surprised? He said, Oh, is thy God able to deliver thee from the, from the mouth of the lions? Then I said, Oh, King, live forever. My God, whom I serve continually, is able to deliver me from the lion. And what happened? He said, My God, whom I serve, was, he shut the lion's mouth. My God, whom I serve, shut the lion's mouth. And uh, he no, the lions did not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocence was found in me. You see that? What happened? This made the king to to write and to to post and publish in all languages that what God is the God of all gods. God is the God of all gods. The God in whom Daniel served is the God of all God. He says in verse twenty six, uh, in verse twenty five. Uh, then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and steadfast forever, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. In verse 27, he delivered and rescued, and he worked signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who had delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You can see Daniel prospered even in the strange land as a result of the management of that fear, that goodly fear, that natural fear that acclimatizes with the odds of an adaptable habitation. You see that also there was one person, there was a man who uh, was able in, in the book of Genesis in the book of Genesis chapter 39 from verse 1 to 23 and Genesis 41 verse 39 to 44 uh, Joseph Joseph was able to uh, Joseph was able to acclimatize with the odds of another people habitation even when his brothers sold him uh, his brothers put him in the pit and then the Midianites uh, sold him to the Ishmaelite and then the Ishmaelite to Potiphar you see he was still Joseph was still he still knew where God was taking him to he saw the vision he saw the vision, he knew the vision, and he carried the vision. He was a vision carrier. And he did everything. He proposed in his heart that will not defile himself, that will not stain his garment of righteousness, his robe of righteousness, until he eventually got to where God wanted him to get to. Let's just read it in Daniel, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. His dream was eventually fulfilled. As a result of his purposefulness. In Genesis 41, I read from verse 41. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. He now became a prime minister of Egypt. And Pharaoh, you remember, he was in a strange land, but that that management of the natural fear made him to acclimatize with the odds, even though he faced many odds and hardship. 
made him to acclimatize with the odds of an adaptable habitation until he finally got to where God wanted him to get to. And Pharaoh put, uh, he says, See, I have sent over the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took it off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second year, uh, he made him to ride in, this, in the second chariot, which which he had, and they cried before him, bowed the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hands or foot in all the land of Egypt. In Isaiah 43, verse 2, to tell us, even when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even when they were cast into the, the fire, the fire did not hurt them. That's to tell you that what? When they fear, they, they fear the natural fear that acclimatizes with the odds of an adaptable habitation. Knowing fully well, purpose, pur purpose in your heart that God will surely deliver you, that God will surely set you free from the odds, from the hardships, and from the tribulation that is in the world. In Isaiah 43, verse 2, when that passes through the fire, the waters I will be with thee. When that passes through the waters, I will be, the, will be with thee. I will. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walk through the fire, but the Lord uh, delivered them. You see, when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. They were not burned, neither did the smell of the fire penetrate them, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. You see that that is the preservation, the protection of the Lord upon our lives. If we can manage the fear very well, the natural fear, the natural fear in us, the fear that acclimatizes with the us of an adaptable habitation, if we can manage it well, we will be able to uh, 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 we will be able to acclimatize, acquaint ourselves with the odds. In Isaiah chapter 41, knowing fully well, we are adapting, knowing fully well that God is going, is taking us somewhere. He's taking us somewhere. He's going to make us pass through the wilderness as he made the children of Israel pass through, he made the children of Israel pass through the wilderness, and so he's, he's making us to pass through the wilderness because we is taking us to a place glorious, he's taking us to the promised land. So we should we should acclimatize that is a goodly fear. We should acclimatize the natural fear. If we manage it well, we will be able to get to that land, that land flowing with milk and honey. In Isaiah chapter 41, in verse 10, it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Don't be afraid. This is the fear that adapts with the environment that one gets to. No matter the natural fear in one's heart or mind, one should know that God sending one to a particular environment or foreign land knows how to deliver one from the adverse condition over there. Just as he helped Joseph in a foreign land and as he helped Daniel in the land of Babylon, to interpret the dreams of kings, to diversify difficulties and dissolve doubts, insomuch that presents were offered unto him, gifts were offered unto him as a result of that. Also, King Darius, as a result of God's protection over Daniel in the lion's den, acknowledged and published in all languages his indestructible kingdom and interminable dominion. You see, God also helped Jonah to go into the neighbor, a foreign land, to preach the gospel of the kingdom unto them. Despite Jonah's deviation, God still redirected him to his will and preserved him there. God knows how to deliver the righteous. He said many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord knows, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You see, God uh, also preserved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, and the fire could not burn them. This shows God's power to protect us as long as uh, we are in line with his will. No matter the storm, pain, or hardship, He will surely preserve one's life. I pray that the Lord will give us proper understanding of this message and cause us to manage our natural fears so that we will not tilt towards negativity, the negative angle, in Jesus' name. You see, the purpose of this topic, the topic once again, which is the balance between faith and fear. It is to... It is to uh, it is to establish a concept in us, uh, to establish a concept in us that we should know the difference between godly fear, godless fear, and goodly fear. As we manage the natural fear, the goodly fear, as we manage it very well, we will tilt toward the positive side, towards the godly fear that will eventually authenticate our entrance into heaven, our entrance into eternal life. We will stray far away completely. Completely, we will strive completely 
from the godless fear. We will not have anything to do with the godless fear. We will neither fear man nor Satan. We will neither fear princes nor Satan, so that we will not be a partaker of the judgment of the doom that will befall all his kingdom. I pray that the Lord will give us proper understanding of this message so that we will be able to balance faith. Uh, even as Solomon the preacher has said, be not over much righteous. Be not over much righteous. Be not over much righteous. In Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes, let's quickly read that before we go to the Lord in prayer. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Be not over much righteous. Be not righteous over much. Neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked. Neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? I pray that the Lord will give us understanding of this so that we will be wise and we will tilt toward the godly fear. We will fear God and will keep his commandment and we will eventually get to life eternal. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now and talk to him. That he will help us to balance all things. He will, make, he will help us to make our moderation known unto all men. or make us to do all things decently and in order. So that that is coming, we will not be found wanting. In Jesus' name.